Welcome to Talk Tennis. This episode is going to be one of those highly debated topics. Um, high tension versus low tension. I'm on the wrong side of this chat, but joining me today is Chris and Troy. Thank you, guys. Hey. Um, I was thinking maybe an easy, fun first question to get into the topic would be, when did you realize in your tennis career what you liked from your strings? And like, when did you start controlling your string tension? For me, it was as simple as uh, getting a job at Tennis Warehouse, having a string machine available at any given time. <laughs> um either getting strings for really cheap or not having to pay for the string period. Um, that's when I started uh, exploring and finding my way in the world of or, or really getting in tune with my racket and my string. Before that, it was all about budget. When I was playing on the junior college team, it was all about cheap string last forever. I don't want to have to restring. I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to go out and grind for three, four hours a day. So that was kind of my, uh, you know, finding, finding the world of, of what works for my racket and string, but maybe Chris can tell his. Yeah. For me, yeah, it was 91, 92 era. Um, I was training down in Florida at the Nick Voluntary Tennis Academy. And then I just started talking to some of the stringers there and some of the guys that were customizing rackets. And it was really a mind blown moment when they were talking about adding weight and doing this and you can change this and do that. I, I just never thought about it. You know, I just picked up a racket. Oh, this one feels good in the shop. And I bought it and went out and played with it. Um, and so then I started playing around with tensions and I was stringing pretty high back then. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like it way in the 60s and I was using a lot of thick nylons, like 15 gauge nylons, just to down the string because I was younger, faster arm and I was swinging bigger. And so I needed something to rein, rein that in and, and give me some control. And then when I was in college, it was all about the budget. And I was swinging with, uh, I think I was using Prince Tournament Nylon 15 gauge, you know, in the high 60s, like probably like 67 pounds in an oversize, in a Don April one oversize. And yeah, it was just, it lasted about 30 minutes, whether I was playing a match or hitting, but it was cheap as chips. And so I could keep just throwing it in there. It didn't really matter. Yeah. I'm going to chime in from the female perspective because this actually does feel like a bit of a divide in the, the industry and amongst players. And I think more females are learning to string younger, but it's weird. There's this whole, like when you're growing up as a tennis player, girls don't often start stringing, but boys do. Cause I just remember, um, at the tennis Academy, I went to, you know, we would give our rackets to the guys, give them string, pay them five bucks, a string job, and they would get it done for the next day. But no, none of the girls strung. No one knew how to string. Even when I went to college, it was like, you just give your racket to the stringer and you ask for what you've been told to ask. So maybe I still have some discovery <laughs> to do with my strings. Um, but definitely it does feel a little bit different. Um, between men and women, I guess. I don't know. That's a weird thing to think, but a little bit. As yeah, same when I was in college, the guy we would string for the women's team. Um, you know, they was like, oh, can you please? Yeah. Like, yeah, no problem. You know, because you got to string your own racket anyway. And um, so you just put another one on the machine and knock it out for them. Yeah, it was um, I don't know why that is. I know some of the best stringers we've had here at T Dub have been women. So there's uh, one woman, Megan, who used to string here and I remember her mounting a racket and I was starting my crosses and I knew she's a really fast stringer and I was like don't you dare finish that before I finish these crosses and so she did <laughs> <laughs> just to make me feel great yeah it's pretty funny yeah it's crazy okay well we're gonna get into the debate but well it's not necessarily a debate but I just have a bunch of categories that I want to talk to you guys about the difference in high tension low tension um I think players like Chris and I that kind of grew up in the string world where there wasn't a polyester started stringing really high in the 60s and if you're someone like me I just took that on into the poly world um but I think it I would assume it really depends on what you guys like and what you define as feel. Uh, we, we talk about this a lot. I, I don't like to feel a lot. <laughs> I don't like to feel. <laughs> so, um, I go with a boardy feel, but I know Troy really always references feel and plush and pocketing and all of that. 
So maybe you can just give me what you're looking for from your string bed, your string setup, and even what are you, what's like your ideal tension right now? And I guess it does depend if you're stringing in a 98, 16 by 19 or a 98, 18, 20. So we can just kind of start there and keep the conversation going. Yeah, Michelle, it's all about the pocketing, <laughs> the dwell time, you know? No, I don't know, Plus. actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for me, um, yeah, you know, before I worked at Tennis Warehouse and I, like I started, like I said, started stringing and experimenting, I used to use a, uh, a Dunlop uh, 200, 18 by 20 pattern. It was a really soft racket. It was like low 60 flex. But when I first started uh, using polys in that racket. I think I was using like the ghost and poly lawn. Cause it was like super cheap and durable, like a 16 gauge. And I actually used to have it strung at like 60 pounds. So it was really, it was pretty tight for a racket like that. And dead yeah. just cause um, other players around me or like the coach at the time, he was, you know, pretty old school, like gut nylon. And, you know, those were the tensions that were recommended. So I was like, all right, string it at 60 pounds, 61. And then, from there, I started getting into like, you know, a little bit better co polys. I went from a Ghost and Poly Lawn to a Signum Pro Poly Plasma. And I was like, oh, this is nice, you know. And then once I started working here and trying different stiffnesses of rackets, like that racket was really, really soft, you know, not, not a wood racket, but essentially, if you think of it that way, you know, you could put metal wire in a wood racket because it's so flexible mm -hmm. and it's still not really going to hurt your arm. So luckily, I had a racket that was like, really soft and so i didn't have to learn the hard way and i didn't really get any arm injuries but uh right away like my first racket i reviewed was a k-blade 98 and that had like a higher stiffness i think like 67 and that's like when i was like oh man this is like definitely firmer than my racket and so i started learning like oh gradually drop the tension to find that like happy medium between you know a stiffer frame like that and a, a stiff poly you know to kind of find the balance so that's kind of how i gradually started working my way down and it was gradual. It was like, you know, 60 down to 55. And then I was kind of like in the 55 to low 50 range for a while. And then, um, kind of worked my way all the way down into the forties. But, um, Chris, I don't know what, what was your kind of reason for starting to go down intention. So I was at the Cincinnati open one year and I was doing a video interview with Nate Ferguson of priority one who's feds, customizer stringer with Ron Yu mm -hmm. over there. And um, we were in the, you know, asking the questions that you do and like, who's the highest tension or the lowest tension. And then they were like, Oh, Filippo Philandri was in here. And, you know, I had to ask him whether it was, it was a good job. I asked him whether it was pounds or kilos, cause it was so low, you know, it couldn't be <laughs> kilos. And then I think he was down. If you convert it into pounds, he was like in the low thirties, like around 35 pounds. And I'm like, huh, that's something I want to try. So when I came back to T-Dub after we had been filming, I started, I was using the vocal average 10 mid at the time. And I started doing a, what I called the low tension experiment. And we did some blogs and some videos on it. There's a thread. You can probably still find it on the message board about it. And actually, you know, when, you know, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. And then I was just like, well, oh. the string machine only goes down to 10 pounds or whatever. Did it 10 pounds. And I wanted to just go lower. So then I just pulled the string straight with my hand and, Clamped it. I don't even know why I clamped it. <laughs> and, then, and then moved on. So I have strung pretty much as about as low as you can put string in a racket. And if it's with a poly, a poly's so stiff. You know, if you just get a coil of poly and try and just twist it, you'll feel how stiff that string is. You can um, you can actually play it quite well, remarkably, with hardly any tension in it at all. Um, and it actually becomes, once you get really low, almost silent when you hit. So it's like cheating because a person can't hear how hard <laughs> you're hitting the ball. And then also, um, and this is one thing I talked about with the T-Dub professor here, was usually the string vibration and the frame vibration are canceling each other out. And then depending on the racket, you're going to find a low tension where they start to harmonize and they ampl you know, the string vibration and the frame vibration get together and they become super buzzy and you're going to get tennis elbow in no time. <laughs> Um, so you got to watch out for that when you start getting super low, like into the 20s. You'll find it's going to vary from racket to racket. You'll find a point where they're no longer canceling each other out. They're helping each other out. 
it's not an enjoyable film. <laughs> I was going to say you should knock on the window and get get the professor. Right. He might have to. He's do, just next door. Yeah, he's like, what are they talking about? He's he's going to have to do like a supplemental um, episode to this because I have a lot of questions, and I know there are others out there that probably have similar questions, and I don't know if you can help debunk these questions or at least um, explain them, but. Here's a couple, I'm just going to start shooting them off with a higher tension. Will my string maintenance suffer more than at a lower tension? Cause a lot of people say like, if you have a racket strung at 62 pounds and you have a racket strung at 42 pounds, there's a greater amount that the 62 pounds needs to drop compared to the 42 pounds. I'm not good with science. You guys answer. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's several ways to look at it. One is tension maintenance. Um, the other is the shear factor of the string. So if you already have your string strung very tightly, there's a greater chance that you're reaching the point where it's just going to snap from stretching um, if you shank it. So if you catch the ball really close to the frame, you can just the shear force becomes too much for the string and it breaks. Whereas if it's a, a more flexible string um, or at a lower tension, it's still got a little bit of room to give and stretch. Um, so it's less likely to shear. Um, and then I think on the flip side of that, uh, lower tension, the string is going to be moving around a bit more. It's going to, especially when you're brushing up, the strings can get displaced more and then they snap back on a poly. So you're going to get, a chance of increased notching, which could lead to premature, breakage. like earlier breakage on the sweet spot area in the middle of the racket. So you got those two kind of factors going in as, as far as string breakage. And then I'll let Troy jump in and talk about tension maintenance. Yeah, I, I would just think, you know, what kind of what, what Chris was saying about the high tension. Just think of the string is when you string it tight like that, you're putting the string under more stress. It's constantly being pulled. You know, that tension is really tight. So it's under a lot of stress and that, you know, would cause it, I would think, you know, more likely to, you know, break on, like he was saying, off center or whatever. Um, as far as tension maintenance goes, I, I don't know if, if, if there's an exact, you know, right or wrong answer, but say you string a poly, a monofilament at 70 pounds, you know, whatever, you're already like putting it under a lot of stress and it's constantly being stretched out. I wouldn't think that there would be much more, you know, for it to give. Whereas, at a really low tension, you're not, this, this, like I say, a really hand pull or whatever on the other extreme, the string's not, it's just kind of sitting. It's more like a, like a net at that point. I, I don't think it would lose tension that fast because it's, it's already really loose. But then again, I don't think it's being tested, so to speak, as, as much as the high tension would be. So I don't know. I think there might be like a sweet spot zone, but um, as far as which one's going to lose tension faster, um, I know that I know exactly like the answers for that as far as string material and string construction, but I would think the one that's being stressed out more is going to get more damage done to it when you're hitting the ball. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, and it's going to play, I mean, a high attention is, is going to play dead. And even when it drops some tension, it's going to play dead. The string is not, it's going to, yeah, not only is it losing tension, it's losing some of its elasticity just over the amount of time you keep stressing it by hitting it with the ball. Um, so it's just going to play dead regardless. So maybe for some players, it remains controllable because it was dead when they first had it strung. They've got two hours of play on it. It's still playing dead. Whereas a string at a lower tension, which is giving more, um, I think once it starts to bag out, the ball trajectory becomes a little higher and it can become a little flighty. So I think I've noticed with certain strings down, especially softer co-polys, you know, so a poly that's blended with nylon or another material, they tend to drop tension. Um, and when they do, they, for me, at a low tension, they become a little flighty and then I'm, you know, missing long. And that's the reason why I use a poly is to not miss long. <laughs> well, and you're starting to hit on another question that I think comes up often with the high low tension debate is um, a control or the control factor, the control and the power factor, kind of the control versus power. A lot of people go into string and a racket thinking, okay, if I want more control, I can jack up the tension and get it that way. If I want more power, I can drop the tension and get it that way. If you are taking a control oriented string and stringing it at a low tension, will you still find control? Yes. If it's, <laughs> if it's a poly. Yeah. If at it's a, low a poly, tension, poly, yes. Mm -hmm. 
is it going to be the right amount of controls for you? Maybe not. You know, and I like Michelle, for instance, you love high attention. You like that firm kind of crisp data feel. Mm -hmm. And so if you suddenly went out and hit with a racket at 46, you'd be like, whoa, just, you know, the ball's going to sit on the strings. It's going to leave the racket at a different part of your swing than it would at the regular tension where it's just in and out, you know, it's flattens on the string bed and then it just comes out. Um, and so I think once you got used to that, you, you would regain the control, but there would definitely be an adjustment period for you there. But I mean, I, you know, like you I used to use high tensions now, you know, 48 pounds is, is sweet, you know, it's a sweet spot for me. And so that's fairly low. I feel, mm -hmm. um, and with the co most co polys, I can be at 48 pounds quite comfortably and, not have to worry about control. Troy, anything to add on that one? No. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like attention pr probably pretty similar to what Chris was saying. Um, but for me, it's also very dependent on the racket and the, the string pattern. So, you know, most, let's say, you know, pure drive type rackets or pure arrow, E-Zone 100, those type of rackets, I'm going to string tighter. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually going to use a thicker gauge of string mm -hmm. tighter for me would probably be like close to 50 on those. Uh, but like when I used to play with the micro gel radical mid plus, which is a 95, 18, 20, very, very flexible racket. That's when I, I think I hit my lowest tensions that I, I felt comfortable. Like I played tournaments back then with uh Solinko Torbite at like 38 pounds. Another thing too, and like Chris was talking about, like when you go so low, uh, it changes the sound. A lot of people don't like, it bothers them. And I, I'm sure for you too, Michelle, like a low tension poly on a lot of rackets, when you don't use a dampener, it sounds horrible. It's like it got this really bad, like just bad sound. Um, that's another thing too, for me is like, I'm like, okay, try it and then try it. I know most people don't want to, but if they're not a dampener person, they're not going to use it anyways, but try it and then try it with a dampener. And I feel like I can get away with really low tensions when I use a dampener. It still feels and sounds solid to me. So that's kind of my my recipe. Um, a few other categories that I think are debated in the high low tension topic. Snapback, we kind of hit on that already. Is am I gonna get more snapback with a lower tension and spin uh potential? Am I gonna get more spin with a lower? tension. I also want to uh, talk about gauges as well, but let's start with uh, snapback and spin. What can you tell me, what can I benefit from with um, a lower tension in terms of snapback and spin? So if, I think if you're using the right kind of string at a low tension, you can definitely get some added benefit from the string moving around and snapping back. The flip side, you know, if you're carrying a tremendous amount of racket speed, so say someone who swings a lot faster than me, they can get that string moving and displacing at a higher tension just because mm -hmm. they're putting so much force. You know, the ball is just really coming through the string bed, um, whereas I'm not going to be generating the speed to get the string to deflect as much as them. Um, and so for me, you know, with a you know moderately fast swing, the low tensions work really well. I get really good spin out of a poly that way. Um, and then I feel that goes away a little bit as I go up in tension because I'm just not swinging as fast fast enough to get the string to help me anymore. Obviously, if you've got a really lot of racket speed, that is going to cancel that out. And then another thing, you know, you are the biggest factor when it comes to generating spin. And so it's what gives you the most confidence to swing as fast as you can. And so if a high attention gives you the confidence to stay on the gas when you're stepping inside the court, guess what? Faster swing equals faster spin. So you'll get the ball spinning quicker with the, the setup you're most confident with. Yeah, my favorite examples of that when I'm trying to explain that to people is uh, Rafa and Dominic Team. Both of them probably have two of the highest spin rates on the Pro Tour. Rafa uses a 15L gauge, a 1.35, a thick, thick poly, um, and Team uses an 1820 pattern. So hmm. both of both of those typically wouldn't be your spin enhancers, right? Mm -hmm. A thicker gauge or a tighter pattern, but they tend to hit some of the most spin on the Pro Tour. So exactly what Chris is saying. If you can swing and have the technique and have as much racket head speed as those guys do, that's the ultimate recipe for top spin, right? 
For sure. And what do you guys feel with different gauges at lower tensions? What does a, a thinner gauge feel like at a low tension? I'm I'm kind of like, I trend towards obviously the thicker gauge. I can't even imagine what a thin gauge string feels like under 50 pounds. I mean, I think for me, uh, the thinner gauges, they work really well up to a point. Actually, at a tighter tension, you hit that point quicker. And there's only so much material that can stretch before there's just nothing left to stretch and the string then is getting pretty close to its shearing point which we talked about earlier which is when it just breaks when the force is being applied to it when you hit that point the string feels very stiff and kind of boardy and it's not comfortable uh you will reach that with a thinner gauge string <clears throat> on your missits a little quicker just because you don't have the amount of material there to stretch you know you just there's less of it mm -hmm. uh, to go around as it were so yeah i'm a big fan of actually thicker gauge always at low tensions. Thinner gauges, you're going to get a, a little bit loopier shot, a little bit more launch. Um, they're going to slide around. They're going to notch. You know, the notching is going to be noticeable a little earlier on too. So yeah, for me, even though like the low tensions, I like a fairly dead response as well, like copolys, and, and so the thicker gauge gets me there. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with Chris uh, as far as like some of the play tester preferences. I think, you know, I, I like the thicker gauge polys as well. One for the control factor. Two for me, the oh well, yeah, the string movement, and then also I, I the other factor is the string density, uh, the weight of the string. I like that heavier feel. It it kind of adds more head weight, mm -hmm. gives you more swing weight, and it just feels like more solid with the thicker gauge, I guess. Um, so I do like the thicker gauges, um, but when I do use thinner gauges, it's because of the certain type of racket. So for example, uh, the Prince Phantom ninety three P eighteen twenty. So ninety three head size. 18 by 20 pattern, really, really tiny spaces in between the string. Um, that I think I've tried the 19 gauge Hyper G or Torbite. I've, I've tried the 19 gauge uh, Solinko strings in that racket, and it actually uh, works pretty well. But anything open pattern, um, say, you know, Pure Arrow, V Core, um, those type of rackets where the string spacing is really big, I definitely like a 16 gauge. Who knows? Sometimes, you know, we even put a 15 light, you know, but yeah, that it, I definitely prefer the thicker gauge. Um, most rackets I use a 1.25, but with the really, really tight patterns, I don't mind going with the, with the thinner poly. Um, what about hybrids? Hybrids at low tensions? Does the poly need to be, does the cross need to be strong at the same, as the same as the mains? Do you drop one or how are hybrids performing at low tensions? Well, I guess nowadays with the, with the, more poly poly hybrids. I guess we got to be specific, but yeah, yeah, I don't mind a poly poly hybrid at low tension, mm -hmm. but definitely when uh, Chris and I did the comparison uh, review or video of RPM blast versus champions choice. Yeah. You really can tell the difference in power levels. So that's a natural gut hybrid with champions choice. And I definitely like stringing about, I'd say roughly at least about five pounds tighter with the hybrid than I did with the RPM blast. Um, but I don't know, Chris can probably elaborate more on that. Yeah, I mean, exactly the same thing. Uh, I found the hybrid to just be way more tension sensitive. Um, and it took me a while to get it dialed in. It was an expensive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> dialing in process. Um, but then once I did, I, I did enjoy the, the response of the string, but that flip flop between, you know, too much power, um, and not, you know, and to just get the control back was, was harder to find. Whereas with RPM, you kind of just know where you are right off the bat. The only thing with RPM is, you know, it's not the best tension maintenance co-poly out there. And so it has this amazingly sweet window, mm -hmm. um, that I love it in. And then <laughs> afterwards, not so much. <laughs> um, I feel like it's always a good opportunity to, reference some of the pros that string low tension. Troy, you've always got a good eye on who's stringing at what tensions. Um, who comes to mind that tends to string lower than instead of higher on the pro tour? Yeah, I think we were just watching them the other day on TV. And I think Chris or somebody was chatting about, was it uh, Manorino? Mm -hmm. that yeah, strings, hey. strings really low. He uses a, a pure arrow and strings it with, I think some Luxalon Alu or Alu rough or something like that. And he goes, what in the thirties, twenties, I'm not sure what his actual tension is, but he's down there. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's definitely one that comes to mind. I know um, Jack sock was known for quite some time 
with his uh, pure Arrow VS or, you know, older version was the Arrow Storm. Uh, I think he uses Alu Ruff, Luxon Alu Ruff, and he was like in the 30s at one point, 35 you know, low thirties, high thirties, maybe sometimes in the forties, but he's definitely been a lower tension guy. Uh, and then another one that kind of surprised me because he uses a hybrid and I definitely think it's a lot of it has to do with arm comfort because he's had some uh, injuries, but Katie Shakori, uh, he uses like natural gut with, I think Luxalon element and he was, and I saw that set up and he was stringing it like in the high thirties with, with a gut hybrid. And I was like, man, he's really got to be like, on his game to control that setup. But yeah, there's quite a few. I know there was like a doubles guy back in the day, Chris. Was it uh Nestor, I think. Daniel Nestor. That was like in the teens, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think so yeah. It was it was the guy that was like we somebody was interviewing and he was like, why do you string so low? And he's like, well I don't want to have to work any harder or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I know that was like a a quote. So yeah, those are those are some that I can think of. I I know definitely like some of the clay court specialists, you know, the South American players, Spaniards, you know, that use full poly on the dirt, you know, they, sometimes they go, they tend to be pretty low because of the spin, you know, probably using a thicker poly because they're on the, the clay courts for durability and whatnot. But. Nice. Um, and a couple of more things before you wrap this one up, you alluded to arm, um, you know, stiffness in your arm or injuries and stuff like that. That's a good topic to bring up as well. Normally we think that something that's super stiff and strong high is going to cause more arm pain. And while we are not doctors, maybe you guys have had experiences where you've tried to string at a higher tension and you try to string at a lower tension. And maybe it was just the tension, fixing the tension that became, it gave you a more comfortable ride at a lower tension. Um, do you have any instances like that, Chris? You can jump in on that one. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the racket you're swinging. If you're swinging a heavy racket, you can get away with a higher tension and or, and or a stiffer string just because the mass absorbs the shock better than anything that you can put in the racket. It's just weight is going to win the war there. And if using a lighter, stiffer racket, you know, maybe look, there's some great multis out there that are still really spin friendly. There's some good options. You can go, you know, try a really thick gauge um, of a softest string material and see if it gives you the control you still need and the spin that you still need. And it gets you away from poly. Especially, I think if you're, you know, the unstrung racket weight is under 300 grams, I'd start looking at, at uh, multi filaments at that point. Anything 300 and over, um, 295 maybe, fine. But anything kind of like dropping below that, then I, I really think you're better off using a synthetic, uh, a multi filament or a sin guard, something like that. Troy, have you, do you have any um, experiences with We're well, just talking, uh, me and uh, Mark Boone were having this conversation on the court the other day, but I was hitting with a racket that had a synthetic gut in it, and it was the Boom Pro. And I was like, man, I love this racket, but the more I hit with it, you know, the string was comfortable, but I really couldn't get the ball to dip. The ball was kind of, you know, spraying on me a little here and there. And I was like coming to the conclusion we've debated it before, but I think I would rather choose like my favorite poly, say like hyper G or something like that and give me any racket. And I'd rather go play mm. a competition with that <laughs> than have my perfect racket and not the right string set up for me. Like have to use a multi or have to use a synthetic. Cause I'm so used to the bite and the predictability and the spin of the poly that that almost is the overriding factor. So I get a lot of questions from people that are using, you know, say a really stiff racket and we'll just name, you know, a pure drive or, um, you know, maybe like a V core or a head extreme, you know, something that it's like on the firmer side of the spectrum. And they're like, well, what poly can I put in here? Or how can I increase the tension to start controlling the frame? And it's like at that point, you know, I want to give them a, a quick fix, uh, a, you know, a cheap string option or something. They can just, you know, have it restrung and be done. But at that point, it's like, for me, I think maybe you should start trying maybe some different frames or demos. Cause I think maybe in that sense, you should go with a softer racket, maybe like a Prince Phantom or a, a Yonex V core pro or a Wilson blade and have the comfort and the softness built into the frame and you could probably get away with using your favorite poly. You know, that's that's how I've always been. I've always preferred the softer, the thinner beam, the that type of feel in a racket. And I can get away with using the 
4G or whatever the stiffest mm-hmm. poly is in the world because of the built-in comfort of the frame. So that's just kind of my perspective on things, but not everybody, once you have a frame like that, can just go and dispose and get a new, get a new racket right away. So but. no, I like that. That's good. That's a good perspective. I haven't thought of it that way. Um, to end this episode, I want you guys to just, uh, reassure someone or give them, you know, that little push to try a lower tension. Let's say our listeners out there are at like 52 pounds in their racket. And obviously everyone's playing with different rackets. What are a couple things that can like maybe just make them restring a racket at 42 pounds or 45 pounds or where wherever um give them some ideas and suggestions and that confidence to try the low tension or give it to me like maybe i'll go try it too <laughs> so i mean i think right off the bat just get ready to experience something really different you know and then don't take it into a tournament. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Go hit with a buddy and then share the racket, have fun with it. You know, maybe do this with a friend. And if, you know, and if you're on a tight budget that you can split, the, you know, and you're not stringing your own racket, so you've got the cost of the string plus the labor, you can kind of split that and you're just like, okay, we'll put it in this racket. We're going to try this string at this tension and we're going to have fun, you know, and you can maybe film it and send it to us. We'll watch yeah. it and then laugh like at it, it with you or, or cry over it with you or however it goes. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I would just say have fun with it. Um, there are some really affordable polys out there that you can try this with. Um, there's we've got a ton of polys on the website for under $10. You know, choose one of those if it's going to be a poly and yeah, give it a whirl. 35 pounds is a great starting point and, uh, and have fun. Nice. I like that. Actually, before you answer, Troy, let's just incentivize this. If you guys are interested in trying a low, uh, Polly, give us a, shoot us an email and maybe we can help you out. Send you some string. I can't guarantee it will be the string that you want, but we've got some extra string floating around. So podcast at tennis warehouse.com. Troy, what say you? Yeah. I mean, obviously if you have the opportunity, you know, maybe you can gradually work your way down tension wise, a couple pounds or two, three pounds here and there to kind of dial it in. You don't have to go 15 pounds lower unless you really just want to have fun. Like Chris was saying and going with a buddy and just do it for that. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely, especially if you're a full poly user, definitely give it a try. Um, Like I said earlier, if you're not a dampener user and you don't like the sound, maybe try that. You know, once you start going, I noticed for me, like in the 40 ranges, it does not sound great when, uh, when you have no dampener and that full bed of low tension poly. So maybe try a little circle dampener, T-dub dampener. And I think that really makes the sound a lot better too. So um, that's kind of how I feel about it. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps up this episode. Everyone go try your string at a low tension and reach out to us if you have any questions about strings or any other gear questions. We're happy to help and happy hitting. 